gets its tin to the fire we fly and the devil will burn. Hey you geeks! Sanderson has just announced that Wind and Truth's final draft is done, and the book comes in at 491,000 words, which, to put into context, is 2,000 words longer than Tor said they could publish in a single volume. That is utterly ridiculous, though. I like big books, and I cannot lie. I have to wonder, though. Is it worth it? There just seems to be so much extra stuff in Rhythm of War. Full spoiler warning, starting now. Like, what is it with Shallan's antics in the war camps just carrying on so long? And then there's this subplot of Marais trying to get a corrupted spren from Sajinat, who seems to be wary of him, but perfectly willing to give Teravangian two of them for reasons really undeveloped. Except, what if... Maybe we can solve one problem with another. What if it indicated that Renarin didn't send Teravangian the corrupted spren to trap Odium? What if the Ghostbloods did? The setup. Rhythm of War opens with what Sanderson has referred to as the Sanderlanch of the book of the year that we time skipped. Kaladin is off rescuing Hearthstone, and Shallan has finally infiltrated the ranks of the Sons of Honor. Now, it's good to give us some time to catch up with our characters after we've been away for so long, but really, did we need an entire chapter of Shallan getting dragged into the chasms by the Sons of Honor, only to get dragged out of the chasms again? We were down there and we looked up here. Now we're up here and we look down there. What's the point? At this point, we've already had a Shallan reintroductory chapter and are up to speed on how her brain works now. And I'm not saying the Sons of Honor don't deserve some time to go out in style after all the trouble they've caused, but this scene only establishes one plot-relevant point. Shallan came alert. They had someone near Dalinar. Perhaps they were lying. But could she risk that? We need to do something, she thought. If Ile had an operative in Dalinar's inner circle, it could be life-threatening. This seed immediately does have plot significance as it goes to Radiant Shallan's mindset when she decides to kill Eole. However, it seems to fizzle out almost as soon as it began when Shallan returns to Urethiru and speaks with Marais. The Sons of Honor didn't have an agent close to Dalinar. They simply managed to intercept some communications from one of our agents, who is close to Dalinar. Shallan immediately assumes that this is the same agent who supposedly killed Eole, and her plot just goes off on that tangent until suddenly it's revealed that Radiant is the one who killed Eole. And Shallan is relieved. Okay, but that's worse. I mean, you, you, you do get how that's worse, right? Now, I'm willing to believe that Shallan is a skilled enough operative to ensure that her communications to the Ghostbloods are not intercepted. But that means that there is another Ghostblood agent close to Dalinar whose communications are capable of being intercepted, like notes. And probably that someone also has connections to Sajanat, as earlier in the very same chapter, Shallan gets mail. When it comes, I wanna will. Mail! Shallan went through her letters and span read communications for a while, and eventually froze on a certain one that had arrived a day before she returned. The deal is set and arranged. The spren will come. She held this one for a moment, then burned it. From context, we can tell that this person is Shallan's actual contact, the Sajanat. It's written in full sentences and not mentioned to be written in glyphs. So, as far as we know, 
it's not Renarin who's writing because Renarin can only write glyphs, I think. Rather, it indicates that there is a third party who writes written communication and has contact with Sajanat and is willing to work with the Ghost of Bloods. Moving into part two, Sanderson restates that the Ghost Bloods are very interested in Sajanat and her corrupted spren. As Vale indicates during a little espionage, corrupted spren are also something Mraze is distinctly interested in. So if she reports to him, she is likely to feed him the information. As it turns out, Vale was totally right, and the spy did pass along the information. However, it was not a spy among Shallan's circle, but rather a horde imitating a pen in Wit's writing kit. When Shallan goes back in to check with Mraes, he does indicate that he's found out about this corrupted spren, but also seems to have had other communications with Sajanat. Mraes said, Again, I must emphasize, watch for any signs of these corrupted glory spread. I worry that Saj Anat is playing us both, and I do not like the feeling. Playing us both, not playing you, which is what I think Mraes would have said if Shalon was his sole contact to Saj Anat. Gosh, these S names are going to kill me! With Shallan gallivanting off into Shades Mar, Mray's savvy businessman he is would totally have cultivated another relationship. And Sajina indicates that she has multiple contacts with humans. Have you been speaking to the humans again to corrupt them with lies? That was the fabrication she and Odium played at currently. Sajanat pretended she had contacted the Radiant Shallan and a few others working on his behalf, anticipating his desires. He pretended he didn't know she had done it against his will. A few others. Now there's quite the loophole. I don't have anything big planned, just a giant blowout party with all the Barbies and plant choreography and a bespoke song. You should stop by. So cool. And I don't think this is limited to Renarin. Who benefits? I don't think Renarin wanted Taravangian to become Odium. He's very philosophical and is very worried about Taravangian's soul when he sees his future change after Taravangian has committed to his plan against Odium. Renarin shows up to try and talk him out of it. You are in darkness, Taravangian, and my father thinks you are lost. I lived through his return, and it taught me that no man is ever so far lost that he cannot find his way back. You are not alone. Renarin then offers Taravangian his hand. implicitly offering to help Taravangian abandon his current plans, which we the audience knows is to get Zeth to bring the sword to kill Odium. I don't think Renora knows all of that at this point, but he wants Taravangian to stop it, and Taravangian refuses. So, Renarin walks away and says... I'll let you know if I see something that could help you decide. And we are led to believe that the next time he contacts Taravangian is indirectly, through a note, apologizing for using Taravangian who willingly wants to be a bait and a weapon against Odium. This just doesn't seem like the sort of plan that Renarin would be down for. We just kind of assume he is because his misspren is enlightened? And this is exactly the sort of assumption that Sanderson wants his readers to examine closely. If I am a blessing father, 
How can we reject the others? How can we condemn the one who made them? Sajinat isn't human and doesn't think like one, but I believe she is trying to find a path toward peace between singers and humans, in her own way. Renarin does seem on board with Sajinat's goal of creating peace between singers and humans, but his way of doing it is to create more enlightened radiant spren and give them out to his friends, like Relaine, his crush. That is the way of radiance. Renarin does not seem to be on board with this other way, this way where we sacrifice Taravangian and see what happens. That way is Sajinat's, not Renarin. Oh no, oh no. We do know that Sajinat approved of this endeavor. I will arrange for you to be given gemstones with two of my children inside, Sajinat said. Odium searches for them, so my children appearing will draw his attention. Good luck, human, when he does come. You are not protected from him as many on this world are. You have made deals that exempt you from such safety. Despite being an unmade, Sajinat seems aware enough to know that she was putting Teravangian in real danger and even upping the ante by sending her spren on a day when Race was in a peak. So it makes sense that she would apologize and have her agent write a letter saying so. But this agent would need to be the sort of person who would be willing to use whatever means necessary to achieve their goal. And we know that the Ghostbloods were willing to capture and trade Lyft to the Fused for assurances that they would get free trade through the Urethiru Oath Gates. I bring a gift, was all Moraes said, to encourage you to meet with my Bapsk to negotiate terms. I had thought to wait until the current turmoil subsided, but my Bapsk is determined. We will have a deal for use of the Oath Gates, and we will pay. Surely it would not be difficult for him to be persuaded that killing Odium and putting T-Man in charge would bring about an end to the war and an opening to the investiture trade in the cognitive realm whose ports he has just secured. And besides, killing gods or positioning others to kill gods is sort of Thydekar's thing. The mysterious device. The only evidence we have supporting that Renarin sent to the Spren was the thought of an extremely dumb Teravangian, and the fandom, myself included, seems to Buy this! Should we, or should we not, follow the advice of the galactically stupid? So ignoring the conclusions of the unreniable narrator, let's look precisely at what Sanderson gives us. He stopped as he found a note, written by Renarin Colin, sealed by his signet. Teravangian sounded out each glyph. It took forever drawing a fleet of concentration spren like ripples in the air for him to figure out what it said. Let's start with the signet. This is the only time that a signet has been mentioned in Rhythm of War. And the Scarlet Pimpernel, Renarin ain't. Adolin maybe, but Renarin just no. Never act on any instructions unless they carry the seal of the Scarlet Pimpernel. But while signet rings are very crucial to the lore of the Scarlet Pimpernel, they only appear in the Stormlight Archive on a whole two other times. The first being all the way back in the Way of Kings. Dalinar idly twisted his signet ring in thought. It was Sapphire with his colon glyph pair on it. Notice that a signet ring carries the Colin glyph pair. I don't think Renarin 
has his own glyph pair at this point. Adolin does and wears it on his standard uniform. His glyphs, the tall tower, and a stylized version of his blade on the back. But Adolin at this point is a high prince in his own right, which seems to be when Alethi culture gives men their own glyph pair. Amaran got a glyph pair when he became the new Sadius, and for you Perrin enthusiasts out there, changed the hammer on the glyph to an axe. Renarin ain't a high prince. He is still only the son of Dalinar Kolin, equal in rank to what Adolin was back in the way of kings as the heir. When he wore his father's Kolin glyph pair emblazoned quite obtrusely on the back and breast, the front fastened with silver buttons up both sides. So, if Renarin had his own signet ring, which we don't know if he does, it would be the same glyph pair as Dalinar's, which is super confusing. However, there is only one other person who we know has a signet ring in the Stormlight Archive. Three guesses who? There, glistening and golden on Mareza's middle finger, was a signet ring bearing the same symbol that Yasna had drawn, the symbol Shalon Stewart had carried, the symbol that Capsule had tattooed on his body. Mraze is exactly the sort of man who would communicate to his agents via sealed note, and if I were one of those agents with orders to get something to Teravangian, I would feign that the thing came from someone who had authority to speak with the prisoner. That is a very small list consisting basically of Dalinar and his son, who have the same signet. And if I was a spy worth my spheres, it would be so easy to forge one of those. Here? Oh, I'm the forger. Now to the handwriting of those written glyphs themselves. Taravangian has a terribly hard time deciphering those, but he is dumb that day, and that could be all. Or perhaps the glyphs were written sloppily. Now, Renarin's bad handwriting was a plot point at the beginning of Words of Radiance. However, by the end, his writing on the wall is pretty legible, and then he spends all of Oathbringer cooking and, 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 and reading and TV watching while we read and cook. It seems safe to say that Renarin's handwriting by the end of Rhythm of War has gotten plenty legible. Rather, it seems that the notes author is trying to disguise their handwriting as a competent Ghostblood agent would know to do. It is quite possible that the note could fall into the wrong hands, like who the Sons of Honor did previously, or it could fall into the hands of a smart Teravangian who would be able to distinguish who the real author was. However, they got dumb Teravangian. Now, normal dumb Teravangian took a moment to see through the light-weaving disguise of Zeth, even though he started talking like a Shin Man right away. So now we are with exponentially dumb Teravangian, who believes that the note came from Renarin, and I don't buy it. Thus the Ghostbloods could covertly help Teravangian and Sajanat kill Rhizodium to ensure free trade and peace throughout the Cosmere. It's just... Good business. Right? There's no way that this hasn't already backfired on them, just as Cultivation's similar plan backfired on her. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Were the Ghostbloods trying to secure trade by offing Odium? Or is Renarin deep in trouble way over his head? Again. Thanks for watching! Please like, share, and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Bye!